I'm sure you've heard the term, you've got to get it in the muscle. Well, <laughs> what does that really mean? To me, it means that in this amazing human meat suit that we are all so blessed to walk around in every day, we can reach a stage of complete automaticity, meaning we are unconsciously competent in something and can literally or metaphorically do it with our eyes closed. Let's use the analogy of riding a bike. Once you learn to ride a bike, you never forget. It becomes totally automatic and easy. It gets in the muscle. You might have some fear well up as you mount a bike for the first time in many years, but soon after getting on the bike, your balance will kick right in and you'll take off free to roam the earth as if you were a child again. And let me tell you, riding a bike is damn fun, but I'm sure you already know this, especially when you are super confident while riding it and have it in the muscle. As Albert Einstein said, Life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. So, knowing that you must keep moving forward to stay balanced, what is it that normally stops you? Ask yourself honestly right now, literally ask yourself, what is it that stops me from moving forward? Is it fear of failing? Is it fear of succeeding? Is it fear of outshining someone in your past? Or maybe it's something else. Just check in and get real, even if only for a moment. Echolocation is actually very simple. The physics of echolocation is very simple and easy to understand. Uh, it's similar to vision in a lot of ways. You have energy, in this case acoustic energy instead of light energy, and the energy goes out from the individual. Uh, in our case, it's in the form of a tongue click. Uh, and then that energy bounces off of everything in the environment, all surfaces everywhere, and comes back to the listener. Now Daniel Kish is blind, and guess what? In this scene, he's riding a bike. Of course you can't see that, as this is clipped from YouTube. He lost his first eye at seven months and his second eye at 13 months. As he briefly shares, he uses sound, or what he calls echolocation or flash sonar, to quote unquote, see where he is going. How cool is that? He's even now teaching other blind people flash sonar and helping them get it in the muscle just like he did. It warms my heart to know people are facing their dragon and overcoming their obstacles, creating their version of freedom. And if he is doing this, I'm confident that you can too. With the five senses we have as humans, sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch, thankfully our other senses will become heightened if one or more is failing or totally failed altogether. It is in this natural state of compensation that all things come back into balance. We really are magical creatures on so many levels. Do you believe that you are? Now you might remember Lance Armstrong, the American former professional road racing cyclist. He was the 1993 professional world champion and won the Tour de France a record seven consecutive times from 1999 to 2005. However, in 2012, he was banned from sanctioned Olympic sports for life as a result of his long-term doping offenses. As part of those sanctions, all results going back to 1998, including his seven tour wins were voided. Now, we might say he was unconsciously competent and had it in the muscle, yes? The challenge here, in all of his glory, it was ultimately a lie. So I want to ask you, where are you lying to yourself and not being real? Now, many people looked up to Lance, and boy, I did too. He was a beast and really pulled off some miracles. It truly is a shame he hit an upper limit, and it all came crashing down. If you want to revisit upper limits, listen to Podcast 002 with Gay Hendricks. He expands on it brilliantly. <laughs> Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Yes or no, was one of those banned substances EPO? Yes. Did you ever blood dope or use blood transfusions to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Did you ever use any other banned substances like testosterone, uh, cortisone, or human growth hormone? Yes. Yes or no, in all seven of your Tour de France victories, did you ever take banned substances or blood dope? Yes. In your opinion, was it humanly possible to win the Tour de France without doping seven times in a row? 
Not in my opinion. Now I must say this, even though my stomach turns while listening to him share here, it's very courageous of him to come clean in this segment with Oprah that he was doping and using banned substances to win all of these. Now not all of us wants to win so badly that we will cheat, and there are many ways to win. We simply need to get real, face our fears, be courageous, and be relentless about our pursuit of what our deepest heart desires. Will you be that right alongside of me? I pray that you will. Now, if you were anything like me, when you were a kid and young adult, you pushed the envelope of physicality. For me, it was bicycles. I was a total nutcase on them and loved them. They eventually led me to race motocross. I remember getting my first bike, a red Schwinn with a banana seat and big, tall, sweeping handlebars, a Stingray it was called. Do you remember this bike? Just sharing this is bringing me back to some awesome memories, one that I remembered vividly in particular. Lydix in elementary school, after school hours, Pleasanton, California. I'm guessing around 1980. This was my pre-mullet days. I actually had a bowl cut and corduroy pants. <laughs> and so did my brother Barry, who was behind me, pushing me to trust that I would not fall over when he let me go. I remember riding along, thinking my brother was still holding the bike upright, only to realize he had let go a long time ago, and I was riding all by myself, balanced, liberated, feeling a freedom I had never felt before. For. Wow, what a rush that was to be able to ride a bike without training wheels and to cruise along, wind blowing through my bowl cut hair. Ah yes, the 80s and childhood, what a glorious time it was. As Bernard Henault says, I believe there are two periods in life, one for the bike, the other for becoming active on one's work. Which one are you in? Welcome to the Face Your Dragon podcast, where we help you, a messenger with a mission, leverage your fear to amplify your voice in the world. On the show, we open up the concept that what you are most afraid of and most resisting are the very things that will set you free. With courage, with clarity, with contribution, you can have it all. This show will engage in deep, enriching conversation with thought leaders, best-selling authors, celebrities, athletes, icons, and regular Joes who have faced their fear and are now using it to create impact in the world. I'm Brad Axelrad, and I'll be your host. This week's guest, my dear brother Scott Cody, is one of the most dropped in and centered humans I know. Not only was he a championship winning cyclist, but he co designed and co led NASA's Culture Change Program Leadership Academy, ranked number seven best in Warren Bennis' Leadership Excellence magazine. He's on the board of directors for the Transformational Leadership Council and founder and executive director of the Association for Transformational Leadership, SoCal. He recently got his pilot license, too. So awesome. Thankfully, Scott agreed to join us and kept his commitment, even though he was feeling a little under the weather this day. When we have it in the muscle, just like Scott does, things seem to flow anyway, no matter how we feel on our body temple. Listen in as Scott shares from a deep grounded place, really from his center and core of who he is. It's truly powerful. Scott, it's so great to have you on the Face of Dragon podcast today. Welcome, my friend. Thanks for having me. I just, I love being in this context with you. We've been in, uh, as I say, on almost every episode, just because I know so many of the, the folks that join us. We've been in multiple contexts, and uh, this is an exciting one to really do a deep dive into, uh, into your mind and, and, uh, and your processes. I'm really excited. Well, thanks for having me, Brad. It's, uh, it's been a thrill to watch you uh, birth this and bring it out into the world, and I'm really happy to be part of it. Thanks, buddy. It's really, really great to have you. All right. Embodied wisdom. You know, let's talk about that from a bicycle perspective. I know that's one of your passions is bicycle riding. Can we anchor your work in the analogy of a bicycle first? I'm curious if there's a way to do that. Maybe we can. So if you think about, you know, everybody talks about riding a bike, has ridden bikes, and you can't really learn how to ride a bike until you do it. And then when you can do it, you kind of never forget. So that's embodiment, when you embody that competency. And there's that video going around, the Smarter Every Day video, where the guy has the reverse bike, where he had a welder change the steering mechanism on the bike so if you turn right it goes left and if you turn left it goes right <laughs> i haven't seen it well it's fantastic he's an engineer and he's he's came up with this idea to test it now he doesn't have distinctions around embodiment 
but he is, you know, a guy committed to learning and he couldn't ride this bike. And the more he tried, you know, the harder it got. He noticed his young son was able to ride the bike in a couple of days of trying where this guy after months couldn't really ride it. And then eventually he taught himself to be able to ride this bike with the reverse because everything in his body, all his neural pathways, all of his embodiment that was kind of hard coded in there needed to change. And it took him being older much longer than his, his very young son. So, you know, we can make that analogy if you like. Went a direction I'm really happy we did. So what is it that we're embodying? Like what, what is this it that we're embodying? I think first, you know, the the first thing we want to look at is human beings are animals, and we're the we're a mammal, and the kind of mammal we are is the social hierarchical mammals like dogs, horses, elephants, dolphins. You know, because we we are that kind of a mammal, we learn and embody all kinds of things in order to be effective in society. We're a social hierarchical mammal. Yet we have these, you know, conscious brains and language and internet and, you know, companies and titles and science and engineering. So we have all this tremendous mental horsepower that has given us so much in modern medicine and, you know, tremendous amount of value. And you could argue today that it's also been the cause of maybe a negative uh, sort of impact on the planet. We can do these interesting mental calculations where we can, you know, decide to let's say, mine a certain mineral so we can produce a certain thing. And now we have an iPhone and the iPhone has a tremendous value and utility for us. But, you know, there's a cost to the environment and cost to the planet. And, you know, mentally, we might be able to play those gymnastics and, and make that value proposition stick. More and more people are waking up that that may not be um, a sustainable game. So that's the mental side of thing, and we forget that's so bright. That capacity is so tremendous. It produces so many wonderful things, and obviously some not so wonderful things. That we forget that we're an animal, and we've forgotten our bodies. Now, my personal opinion is that the cost of forgetting our bodies is that we can only be in relationship with the planet through our bodies. So when we over-identify with the mind. We forget our bodies, then we disconnect from a sacred relationship with the planet, and therefore we can we can harm it. Now, Ken Robinson, uh, Sir Ken Robinson, on that famous TED talk said, you know, that most people think of their body as a machine to carry their head around, and you know, unfortunately, that's true. So embodiment means a couple things. It means returning back to a relationship to our physical self, to our whole self, from that place of relationship. You know, to to let's say stop just living in our head only from that place of being in our body we it opens us up to so many beautiful and powerful possibilities we can be in better and deeper relationships with other people we can have access to intuition certain kind of wisdom that lives in our body we can feel and experience of whatever's going on around us and we can shift our fundamental competencies that live inside of our body, like riding a bike, through practices. And we can change our embodiment. So my work has been all about helping people shift the embodiment that they are to be more aligned with their vision or commitment they have for the future. And when those two things are lined up, it's pretty powerful. And when they're not in alignment, other people can notice and it can make getting to where you want to go harder. Well, it's really a primal thing, isn't it? We can sort of, we have our spidey senses can feel somebody who isn't really dropped into that state. Exactly. So people can feel it around you because we are the social hierarchical mammal. So everyone is kind of, you say spidey sense each other, but most people aren't conscious or aware of the feelings they're having or the somatic response they're having to other people. So example, somebody has a business idea and proposes the business idea to, let's say you, and you're not interested. Okay. Now, let's say your physical body is vibings, you know, the spidey sense, as you said, the other person just isn't all that. The, the What they're proposing and how they're showing up and the alignment between the offer they are and the embodiment they are and how they show up just doesn't add up for you, you and your body. So you're uncomfortable. You don't want to trust your future to their their future. So you, you're you out. You pull back. You you aren't interested. You don't return the call. You, you um, aren't compelled to move forward with that person. 
Now, the person finds you and says, hey, what's up? And you say, well, I'm not really interested. They say, why not? Generally, you're going to give a logical answer like, well, the market share or the uh, the performer doesn't really add up or the strategy doesn't make sense or, you know, the economy or you give some logical head right. answer. Most people don't ever say, well, I checked in with my body and the intuition I have and the somatic sense I have of you doesn't have you, you know, showing up somatically lined up to what you are representing here. So I'm not feeling safe and it looks too risky for my future. So I'm out. Interesting. Let me insert this though. This is an inquiry I've been in for years around this sometimes false flag intuition and oftentimes it's fear. So how do we how do we make that distinction between that sort of intuitive hit that we're talking about versus, whoa, it's just a, a past recall or neural pathway firing off. The, the face that you made subconsciously reminded me of when my dad yelled at me at eight years old. <laughs> like, you're right? I mean, when, when yeah. do we know? Because sometimes I've had, oh, it's my intuition. And I'm like, are you sure? And we'll dig around and maybe do some, peel some layers back. And they're like, you're right. It was just fear, Brad. That's all it was. I think it's a great question. You know, the fact that you can have the consciousness and awareness to notice yourself at that level and pause and go, wait a minute, what is this? Is this this or is that? That's really high level, you know, self-awareness and speaks volumes to who you are. Not everybody can do that or is even interested in doing that. But you're right. You know, it could be. It could be that it is something from the past that has nothing to do with this person and, you know, and that would take some competency to reflect and notice and dig in order to ferret that out. But that itself is an embodied competency. Yeah, the unconscious competence that you spoke of in the beginning with the being able to ride the bicycle, right? right. I want to circle back to the bike, though, because I don't feel like we're done with that conversation. So, sure. So you're saying that this guy reversed it. So if he was trying to turn left, it would go right. Correct. And he couldn't he couldn't just lean into that. He was really struggling. I, I mean, I, that's kind of how a stand up jet ski works, honestly. So it uh -huh. took months of reverse engineering or sort of reversing those neural pathways to get that. Yes. That it's a backwards yes. lean. Right. Yes. So and that's the that's the fun thing. So when you don't have the distinctions of embodiment and you try to do something like that. And you go, oh, I can't do it. It's hard. You make up all kinds of mental things. It's not possible. And you might quit on the learning. And you might make a story about yourself being, you know, an uncoordinated or, you know, negative, negative self judgment, negative self talk. Uh -huh. When you understand that it's an embodied skill that you have to unlearn and relearn, it's going to take time and fall in love with the process of embodied learning. It's still going to take you a little while to figure it out, but you're not going to have a bad time while you're doing it. And you're not going to beat yourself up. Oh, that's such an interesting point. So I just, you know, being a, uh, an almost professional motocross racer and extreme sports guy my whole life. Now I'm older, you know, meaning, meaning 20 years later, right. I have a different experience of what you just said, how I would, how we as younger adults will just huck ourselves into something without the fear, without the hesitation sort of more trusting ourselves as I'm older now, the, the brain I've had more wounds. There's more things that are, right. that are kicking in that have me make a different choice or a different distinction in a, in a moment. So how does age come into play with this? You know, I mean, I feel like I'm both more embodied and both more in my head at the same time. Uh, I was listening to Alison Armstrong yesterday. She talks about that men uh, reach a certain age and they get more um, estrogen or they become a little bit more feminine in their, in their, in their methodology or ways of being just, just biochemically. So how does right. age kind of come into things or, or does it? Well, I think it does. I mean, it has to, right? So when we're younger, we have potentially less fear or doubt. We have less experience that we can't do something or that, you know, we haven't been hurt as many times. Um, we uh, have a lot more testosterone for men, right. anyway, you know, and yeah, you know, that's a that's a combination for a lot of interesting experiences. And I think when we're younger, our concerns, and again, speaking more about men than women, our concerns are more around uh, proving ourselves, taking care of uh, kind of a self-authoring. I don't know if self-esteem is connected here, but like ego-based concerns for capability, identity, producing some evidence that we're maybe strong or we rank among other 
uh, men or boys, you know, in the upper group rather than the lower group, you mm-hmm. know. Yep. So those are like the concerns that come with being younger as, as a man. As we get older and, you know, I'm 58 now, I notice that I don't have a lot of those concerns anymore. <laughs> right. You know? The concerns I have are more around, you know, family and relationship and contribution and service and legacy. So then I find myself, as you said, hucking myself <laughs> into different types of experiences, yeah. you know. Less of that. Not, not, <laughs> not off of, uh, not necessarily off of uh, cliffs or anything. Although I am very proud to say three years ago, I attempted to jump my BMX bicycle off of a, uh, off a, off a jump in Maui. And, um, while I'm proud of attempting, I'm really not proud of the landing. Oh, boy. I think I broke, I think I broke about two ribs and, uh, awesome. But I got back on the bike and finished the run. Even I had a couple broken ribs. So, okay. But what do you mean? Finish the run Was it a BMX run or mountain bike? Yeah. Mountain bike. The Sorry, mountain bike. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Mountain, mountain bike, Makawa forest. They set up a really nice little, little course there. So when you're working with uh, the likes of NASA or AT&T, uh, whatever you can share, like what, what are some of the challenges that happen in sort of executive or corporate cultures that need to be overcome? And, and how is there that sort of tribal, anti-somatic <laughs> way of being where everyone's in their head or they're in their posturing or uh, trying to earn rank in, in a company, climb the ladder? Like yeah. how, does, how yeah. does all that come into play? Well, I think you framed it up pretty nice. Um, you know, I do a lot of work inside organizations all around the world. And the work I do is really to help create cultures where high performance can show up and high performance teaming. And high performance teams are, the, are made up of high performance individuals. Our view on that is high performance individuals are really looking at themselves and how they're showing up and how that's affecting the group. And they're in constant space of awareness and learning and uh, growing together with their colleagues. And that is really foreign territory for a lot of people inside companies. So the most companies are set up in a traditional hierarchical structure and department. So you kind of have a little bit of a grid there of levels up and down and, and right and left. And then individuals are incented to perform well in their individual role. So they get often referred to as KPIs, key performance indicator for their particular role. And everyone's trying to optimize their role and get the bonus or carrot connected to their individual performance. Enlightened companies, they'll have, you know, I don't know, make it up uh, 60% of the bonus is uh, individual KPIs and then maybe some for the department and then 15% based on the profitability of the whole company or some, you know, something like that. So then as you get higher up in rank or closer to the C-suite, as we say, uh, you've, you get, you know, more and more of the compensation is connected to results and you have uh, people who are type A personalities. They want to you know, become the CEO or president. And what we can see a lot of times in executive teams, quote unquote, is it's not really a team at all. They call it a team, but everyone there is really in a private competition with each other for budget and uh, results and resources and attempting to outshine their colleague so they can get promoted. That can lead to a lot of dis- dysfunction and distrust and uh, mediocrity or low performance. So there's a negative a negative feedback loop, if you will, uh, for, for, for hopefully they're getting the feedback that when they're ladder climbing, they're, they're, they've lost their focus and they're sort of their mission and their purpose. Is that what I'm hearing in that? Well, I don't know if they lost it because they may not have ever had one in the first place that was uh-huh. collective and uh, collaborative and you know i'm not saying everybody obviously it's just typical you know what would you say you t- let me let me frame it this way scott so so there's the the story of crabs trying to get out of a bucket you know that one yeah. of course right mm-hmm. and they, they all die because they keep trying to pull their their buddy off of the side that's getting out right right is, right. is that what happens is that well what, that could what? happen that's one typical result i mean Pulling somebody down is really a pretty unconscious, low-level performance. It's more like people not necessarily pulling each other down, although that can happen, is just trying to um, compete with your colleague rather than collaborate. 
Interesting. Yeah. Freeman uh, was sharing, Freeman Michaels was sharing the, the, the from group to team kind of concept. And that's, that's that shift of everyone sort of being independent, basically to interdependence, right? Um, Yeah. Painting it with my own brush there, but allowing the synergy to happen. Synergy can't happen unless you're, you're rowing in the boat the same direction. Yeah. Yeah. And then this comes back to, you know, some of your uh, work on fear is that, you know, the fear often is, is that I'm going to be left behind or they're going to outshine me or I'm not going to get somewhere. And that fear can lead someone to, let's say, showing up too individualistic inside the group because they don't trust. And this is really the foundation for high performance is creating and supporting and enhancing trust inside of an organization and inside of yourself. When we are fearful, we're not we're not trusting. And it's kind of counterintuitive. It's you know like skiing with where you have to lean, you know, down the hill uh, in order to have control. You gotta right. lean into it. You gotta trust in order to produce trust. And if you don't trust, you're gonna act as an individual and that's gonna make it worse. Almost everything comes down to trust. And the, the, the thing that I've really been leaning into around trust is that I, at least from my perspective at this stage, it's a matter of trusting everything is happening for us instead of against us. Trusting God, mm-hmm. source, the universe, whatever you mm-hmm. want to call it, will provide what we need. And, and uh, that individualism or that indivi- individualistic perspective it really doesn't build trust like you're suggesting. It just it just breaks it all down. Yeah. So let's let's sort of shift gears to a sort of the personal away from executive more into or the corporate more into the personal, you know, the personal entrepreneur, the solopreneur. How does the somatic work really help this listener create the results they need? Like give us some give us some action steps or some ways to sort of uh, experience a deeper way of being that will help support a solopreneur. Sure. Well, I think the first thing to talk about is let's just give it the common name of uh, self-confidence. And, you know, we were talking just a moment ago about trust. So for me, it comes down for solo entrepreneurs and anybody, really, it comes down to self-trust. Do I trust myself to be okay? Do I trust myself to survive? Do I trust myself? See, solo entrepreneurs and risk takers put themselves out there and we might put ourselves out there. We need to put ourselves out there. Someone's telling to put ourselves out there. We have a good idea. We put ourselves out there. But do we trust that it's going to be okay? And a lot of times people are out there and they have their attention split between the thing they say they want to do and self-preservation or taking care of themselves or are they going to be okay. And when our attention is split, that affects our way of being and it affects Everyone else around us, people, they can tell that we don't trust ourselves. And so why should they trust us if, they, if we don't trust ourselves? This is the beautiful thing about embodied work is that it can help us to develop something I call authentic self-confidence. It's grounded and rooted in, in the body, in the, in the embodiment you are. So you build a body that you trust that when you put it out or huck it into situations, you can see that you're going to be okay, that you have evidence that you're not going to disintegrate, you have, that, that you're going to be able to handle the situation. Well, the worst fear that lots of people have is they get into, they put themselves out there, they go into the situation, and then something's going to happen that they can't handle, and they're going to be embarrassed or humiliated or fail or whatever, and... And so what they're really saying is, I don't trust myself to handle the situations I'm putting myself into. Uh, it's so well said, man. I, what, what came to mind as you were sharing that, we're going to get David Rock on here from the Neuro Leadership Institute in uh, uh, back east. And uh, he talks about the SCARF model, which is really interesting. And one of, one of the things is that the, the social component or the social potential for social ostracization right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so we have that at that primal level. It's such a delicate balance of, of trusting everything and then not being ostracized or trusting, hucking ourselves, whatever it is, trusting mm-hmm. that, that the business partnership will work, but also the self-preservation. That's such an interesting right. point, Scott. We, mm-hmm. we, we toggle between that. So the opposite of that is what? What is the full embodiment of that trust? It's self-trust so that you, you're not splitting the line? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, you have practiced enough, you've produced enough embodiment where you have 
put yourself into the fire enough times and you see that you are okay. You see that you handle it effortlessly and easily. You see that you conduct yourself under stress, under pressure in a way that inspires people rather than having other people be concerned or afraid. And you have done that enough where you can relax. You don't have to worry anymore. Great metaphor is like a martial artist, you know, practice martial arts for quite a long time. And then, you know, you've been in a situation and, and you've, you've been tested for your belts and that changes you. You have a different view of yourself. You have a different level of confidence. The best martial artists are not fighters. You know, they, they, are calm and and they have a calming influence on other people and they're not having that mind chatter of self doubt anymore. Uh, they don't have to do any you know martial arts in order to feel that way or for other people to feel that way around them. Another example could be, let's say you're uh, some kind of musician, practice for years to to be able to play certain music, and you're let's say a virtuoso you can do it with a blindfold <laughs> you know you you can do it without the music you can do it from your head you can do it when you're tired you can do it you know different times of the day you know but then you get on stage in front of 2000 people and you can't remember or you get nervous or you start sweating or you get shaky what's going on there so that's the difference in the in the embodiment or the somatic learning Yes, you're a virtuoso musician at home with no audience. Yeah, right. But in front of people, you know, it's a whole different thing. Well, for sure. I mean, I, I always talk about, like in the interview with uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, or episode one, I talk about how uh, the fear of public speaking was my greatest fear, the biggest dragon <laughs> I had to face. It's also the the one that set me free. But But through the perpetual hundreds, if not thousands of hours of speaking in front of thousands of people, uh, you know, it starts to become embodied. Um, right. That's right. Yeah. And motocross, and he, same thing. You know, it was really, really tough to learn and you crash and burn and break stuff and eventually it becomes unconscious competence. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. So the theory is, or one of the theories, is that the more you do something, the more it gets, it gets out of the fear, out of your head, into the body, it becomes in the muscle, you know, that saying of in the muscle, literally it's in the muscle, it's in your heart, it's in your, uh, it's in your fat cells. Is that, is that really what's yep. going on? Yeah. It's, it's, it's competency that lives in your body. And the thing about it is, is that we all have a, a certain level of embodiment right now. We all, you know, do automatically. So for instance, if you're home listening, uh, now if you're driving the car, you know, just cross your arms in front of you. How we always do that, we cross our arms, kind of rest them on our chest. Okay, great. Good job. Now, put your arms down and cross them in front of you the opposite way. Well, that's tough. I'm trying. <laughs> Hold on a second. Yeah. So the first one, when I just said cross your arms, <laughs> you did it how you've embodied doing it. You don't have to think about it. Your body knows how to do it. It's effortless. You can cross your arms. Like there's no big deal. But when I tell you to cross them the other way, we have to engage our brain and we have to slow down and we're clumsy. We might even hit ourselves in the face. Not embodied, right? Wow. But if you did that 2,000 times, it would become embodied. And so we have this luxury of being able to shift our embodiment. We can practice new things and we can produce a new embodiment. And that's why I dedicated my life to this work because it's reliable it's effective. It produces results under stress and under pressure. Unfortunately, it takes time. You know, it's not a weekend thing or a uh, instant thing. You have to practice something for quite a long time. But once you do and you embody it, then it's yours and everything changes. Well, I mean, I, I would say that that's incredibly true. I mean, I'm probably, you know, maybe the top 10% fastest motorcycle, dirt bike, motorcycle rider in the in the world. I'm pretty confident to say that. And it took 15 years to get there, right? Um, that's really interesting, Scott. So something that just came to light as you were sharing that is the speed at which you could lose it. It takes many, many years potentially to, to get there. But can it be lost? And, and if it's lost, did you not really have it 
fully embodied then? Is that the deal? Well, I, I would say you can lose it if you don't keep practicing, you know, so we have atrophy, uh, you know, if you take a, you know, something, you know, like a sport, bowling, whatever, if you don't practice, you're going to lose some percentage. But if you start practicing, you're going to get it back pretty fast. I recently got my private pilot's license to fly small planes. Love it. And, you know, they say when you're older, it takes longer and it's tougher. And, you know, I, I was gung-ho. I'd been studying and in, in love with it for a long time and thought that I was going to sail right through, you know, the training because of my passion <laughs> and my interest, <laughs> kind of ignoring my biology a little bit. And so, you know, when you start doing the private pilot training, the, the first couple of lessons they schedule for you to, for – a half an hour. So you got to drive to the airport, book all this thing, and then you only get to half an hour. So I say to the guy, I say, listen, you know, can we do two hours at a time? So I want to use my time efficiently. You know? and he goes, no, we, we just do a half an hour for the first couple of lessons. I'm like, okay. Well, I can tell you the wisdom of that because when I got done with my first couple of lessons, after a half an hour, I was more beat up and tired <laughs> mentally and physically than if I had ridden my bike for three hours. It just, the amount of cranial energy is required to manage everything that's happening to you in the moment. Because it's not embodied, you're not on automatic, you're having to use right. all that conscious energy. It just wiped me out. But, you know, now I can jump on a plane and fly across, you know, LAX airspace at night to go visit a friend for dinner like I'm driving a Volkswagen bug down to the 7-Eleven. Well, I'm surprised you know? I didn't know about this, buddy. How did I how did I miss that you got your pilot's license as much as I've known you? Yeah, uh, well, congratulations. Yeah, so that's been a really interesting thing to just watch myself go through that and have to produce a new level of embodiment and just the other thing that's so great is with the background experience I have is just surrendering to it takes time and not you know making myself right or wrong for how long it takes and enjoying the process of learning and becoming embodied and um it does you know it does take a while but the fruits of your labor are so sweet because things become effortless and it becomes something that's part of you and it's reliable and it really 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 serves i'll tell you one fun story that's kind of connected to another thing i know you're you're really uh keen to talk about here and it's sort of like a fear kind of thing. But, you know, when someone is in a in a high-pressure, high-stress environment and we kind of get, I say, off-center, we can go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. You know, it's kind of a response to fear or being overwhelmed with an experience. Fight, flight, or freeze, very well-documented thing that happens to a human being. And those are survival modes that we get thrown into, and they work pretty well because we do survive. They They can. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they can. <laughs> um, now, we're not maybe our best self in those modes, and right. you know, but we made it through. So embodiment training can help to disarm or disable that trigger to go into those modes so we can be more elegant, more powerful. Well, when I was first learning all of this, just barely first learning all this embodiment stuff, I was really active in racing bicycles, and I went to the world championships in 1996 in England. And I was on fire with my cycling. I'd set a record, ended up lasting for 12 years. I was, you know, top elite level in my events. And I went to England to, to race and I set a personal best in a, in a qualifying heat. And one of the top, I think I got fourth place in this particular qualifying heat in the world. And despite some challenges. And then there's an event called the Olympic Sprint where you take four guys and you put them on the track velodrome racing at the same time. And, you know, one guy does one lap and peels off. Another guy leads the second lap and he peels off. And then the third guy does the third lap and he peels off. And then the fourth guy, you know, does the last lap. And they, these three British guys came up to me and asked me to be on their Olympic sprint team and to anchor it and be the fourth place guy because of the, the qualifying time that I had done. And I was honored and tickled. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, one of those moments where you get picked to be on the team, <laughs> you get picked yeah. to be the that kind of thing. And yeah. I was just tickled and afraid. God, the pressure and, uh, you know, the expectation and uh, how am I going to do? And, and I got off center and I got afraid. And the cost of that was I couldn't find the key to unlock my bike. So every night we'd lock our bike in the velodrome with a kryptonite lock, you know. 
rather than trying to schlep it back to the hotel. I couldn't find the key, go back to the hotel. I'm freaking out. Like, I don't want to disappoint these guys. We've entered the thing. I don't want to embarrass myself. And I'm off center and I'm looking, looking. I can't find it, you know, nowhere, anywhere. And people are going to try and cut the lock off and they can't because it's impossible. And <laughs> it's kryptonite. The event, the event is coming up. Yeah. Events coming up. And so finally they go, well, we'll have to give you a different bike. And the only bike that anybody has that I could ride, like, it's too big for me. But I'm going to do it anyway, right? So I'm like a, so I look like a little kid out there. I'm, <laughs> I'm on this bike that's too big. I'm in this event. You know, if you have any pride or ego, that's out the window. <laughs> and we did the event and, uh, you know, we ended up getting fourth. And we missed a medal by, by one place. Now, if I had my own bike, maybe we would have medaled, you know? Well, here's the sad part of the story. The key to unlock my bike was exactly where I put it, which was in my gym bag on the outside pocket with the mesh where I could see it really easily. I was so freaked, I just couldn't see it. I lost the awareness, you know. It was it was a really interesting and humiliating and, and big learning. I mean, it's right where I put it. I put it in a place where I could see it, and I couldn't see it because I was so freaked out. Tell me how to land the plane with all that we've talked about today. What is one sort of final thought to get folks when they get off center and they lose awareness, they're, they're in fight, flight, or freeze? What do you recommend someone does in that moment? Two things. Everyone will tell you this. Breathe. But watch yourself breathe. Breathe. Slow down. Take a few breaths. Deep breaths. Bring your awareness inside of yourself. Relax your body. And that's the beginning of a transition. That's the beginning of coming back into yourself and not being on automatic. The second thing is very often, once you do that, you can notice that you might be angry or sad or upset or frustrated or whatever the emotion is. And that emotion wants us to do something. The emotion is trying to drive us into action, healthy or unhealthy action. And the second step, which is even harder, is to not do anything and just sit and observe and be with whatever's happening in your body. And that's like riding a buck and bronco. And I know you have direct experience with this, Brad, because you've shared some of these these things with me, and that's why I appreciate you, and I'm proud to be on this podcast, because I know you've done this work. And by sitting with it and observing it and not doing anything and not letting it run you, you expand your embodiment. You mm. expand your capacity to hold energy. And then you can trust yourself and other people can trust you because you're not on automatic pilot anymore. I'm uh, even just breathing. I had noticed I wasn't breathing anywhere near as deep as I possibly could have been. And thanks again for that reminder. And I wanted to mention that earlier. I, I, when we first got on the podcast, I could hear you really almost mindfully. I don't know that it was a conscious thing, but it's probably more of this automated, automatic or automaticity for you at this stage. You've embodied deep breathing. So as we were in the interview, I heard you just breathing like a really deep breath, and then you would be very mindful and intentional in your next sentence. Of course, we need to breathe in between sentences, but it felt and I experienced it as like not like anyone else I've heard. I'm like, Scott is really taking deep breaths as he's, as he's speaking. Well, good noticing. I, th I think it's my trick to access a place inside of myself that I want to speak from rather right. than just the first thing in my mind that comes up. Yeah, let that be an amazing lesson for us all on the uh, podcast here. So before we speak, we, we check in and speak from that deep down place that Kyle Cease will talk about. He's, he's great, talks great about that. All right, so Scott, where does everybody find you? Embodiedwisdom.com. And there we have links to our Art of Leadership Mastery Program, which is our six-month-long embodiment journey. And there's a logo for that in the top right-hand corner or Embodied Wisdom dot com slash a l m that's where we do the work that we originally developed for nasa and we've been doing that once a year for 20 people for the last 11 years our next program starts in april excuse me in june and my email's there my uh, contact information so i'm happy to hear from anyone it's been an honor so grateful to have you on and trust that everybody else is as well and excited to see where this podcast shapes up and uh, to hear feedback from folks how much it's changed their lives. So thank you, brother. You're welcome, Brad. Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. 
I want to thank our guest for sharing his heart and brilliance with us. Thank you, Scott Cody. We're all so grateful for your contribution to the world. You can find out more about Scott at embodiedwisdom.com. And as we dive deeper into facing your dragon, I want to offer the opportunity for you to discover the number one hidden fear stopping you from earning what you're worth. Be sure to take the one minute quiz at couragequiz.com. If there's something here I mentioned that you want to review again, keep in mind we keep all the notes for you, including links to everything we've talked about today. You can find the show notes for this episode at faceyourdragon.com forward slash episode 011. And finally, I would like to invite you to subscribe and leave a five-star review for the Face Your Dragon podcast by visiting faceyourdragon.com forward slash subscribe. Be sure to share this episode with your tribe on social media if it was useful for you. We'd love that. And join our conversation in the Face Your Dragon Facebook group as we talk more about your greatest fears being the very thing that will set you free. Tune in to episode 12 because I'll be talking with my dear friend, the amazing Susan Leahy. She is seriously one of the most alive and vibrant humans I've ever known. You will adore this woman and be blown away by her huge heart and soul and brilliant mind. We discuss how having fun and being happy, all sides of deep happy versus shallow happy, is such an important piece to facing our fears. And how making a choice about how we respond to the harsh things we say to ourselves and how to get back into self-love and alignment is key. This incredible being and many more on the Face Your Dragon podcast. See you on the next show. And remember, when you face your dragon and take the leap, you will break free.